This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. The day my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive. As I am taught the Word of God, my life is changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. And today's message is entitled, Money is a Heart Issue. Money is a Heart Issue. If you would, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Money is a heart issue. Tell your neighbor, say, it's about the heart. Tell your other neighbor, say, it's about the heart. As we've been learning in this series in 2020, money and how we handle money and how we use money, it reveals our heart and our priorities. We've mentioned what Dr. Lester Summerall said many years ago to my father. He told him, if a man's not right with his money, that man's not right. And if you don't have a man's money, you don't have his heart. Our two launching scriptures in this series have been Matthew 6 and verse 21, where Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Again, money and how we use money and how we handle money, it reveals where our heart is. And then Jesus went on to say in Matthew 6 and verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Some translations say given, all these things shall be added or given unto you as well. So money is a hard issue. And how we use money and how we handle money, it is a hard issue. Tell your neighbor, say, it's about the heart. About the heart. Tell your other neighbor, say, it's about the heart. About the heart. Now, number one this morning, number one, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Luke 16 and verse 10, Jesus said these very words. He said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. You've heard pastors say that everything is true in the Word of God. God's Word is true, but everything else is a lie. And if ever there's been a year where we have seen that, it is in 2020. Everything we see out there in the world, it is a lie, but the Word of God is true. We live in an age of lies. We live in an age of mendacity. We live in an age of dishonesty, but that ought not have any place in our lives as the children of God. We ought to be truthful. We ought to be honest. In every area of our lives, we ought to be truthful and we ought to be honest, and that should be true in our finances. Money is a hard issue. If you want to be trusted with more or with much, you must handle the little that you have now well. If you want to be trusted with more or with much, you must handle the little that you have now well. Don't complain about the little. Don't grumble about the little. Don't despise or hate the little. The Bible tells us to despise not the day of small beginnings. You gotta get started somewhere, amen? And as we saw Wednesday night, as we'll see this Wednesday night, if you don't take action, nothing will ever change. So don't despise the day of small beginnings. In fact, thank God for small beginnings. Thank God that he makes sure that we grow and mature over time. Thank God that 
thank God for him not blessing us too much and too quickly or before we're ready to handle that new level. Amen? I don't want him to put something in my hands that I am not yet prepared for. I don't want him to entrust something to me that I am not yet ready for. So right where you're at, have an attitude of gratitude. Be thankful for what you have now. Whether little, whether much, or somewhere in between, be thankful. And know that if you're faithful right where you're at over time, God will bless you with more. If you want to be trusted with more or much, you must handle the little that you have now well. God knows that if you're dishonest with little, you will be dishonest with much. God knows that if you're not faithful now, if you're dishonest now, if he gives you more, you're going to be dishonest and unfaithful with that. Our heavenly father is wise and he rewards obedience. He rewards good stewardship. So are you faithful with what God has already blessed you with? Do you take care of and maintain what God has already blessed you with? And that includes your car. I remember being a little guy in church and hearing Dr. Gene say that he could walk out into the parking lot and look at someone's vehicle and prophesy their future. Now he was being facetious, but there's a lot of truth in that. Does it say, wash me from some teenager riding that on your car last year? <laughs> was something damaged in 2017 that has still not been fixed? See, how can we ask God for more if we don't take care of what he has already blessed us with? So it ought not look like you've been on set in an apocalypse movie or something. How are you taking care of what he has already blessed you with? How are you taking care of your apartment or your home? How are you taking care of your property? You know, in your neighborhood or wherever you live, does your, pro does your property stand out above and beyond all the others, or does your property look like it is in need of an intervention or one of those TV shows? And you got to realize, you don't just represent you. You represent the family of God. You represent the kingdom of God. And how you take care of what God has blessed you with, that's part of your witness. See, we, we got to throw aside this thing of having this look and act that we're defeated. Talking like we're defeated, acting like we're defeated, looking like we're defeated, and sending a message to a lost and dying world that, well, if they give their lives to the Lord, they're going to be messed up too. No, a thousand times no, a thousand times no. We ought to look like we are victorious, and we ought to maintain and take care of and be good stewards of what God has already blessed us with. So you've got to steward what he has already given you. And if you want nicer or newer or better, you got to take care of what God has already blessed you with. It's a principle. If you want nicer or newer or better, you got to take care of what God has already blessed you with. So you got to take care of the yards you have now. God cannot bless you with bigger if you cannot take care of the little that you have now. Got to take care of it. Number two, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, worldly money, who will trust you with true riches? If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Verse 11, Jesus said, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, worldly money, worldly finances, then who will trust you with true riches? I said last Sunday that some Christians have the wrong mindset that it's wrong to have anything. But there is another wrong mindset, that if you have anything, you're not spiritual or holy or righteous. And I say nonsense, because Jesus said in verse 11, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, then who will trust you with true riches? So if we can't handle money well, then we cannot handle true spiritual riches. If we cannot handle worldly finances well, then we cannot handle true spiritual riches. If we cannot steward our money and our finances well, then we cannot be good stewards of true spiritual riches. If we cannot steward our money and finances well, 
then how can we be good stewards of the kingdom of God? And how can we be good stewards of the assets in the kingdom of God? So you have to make up your mind that right now, whatever you have, whether little, whether much, you're going to be a good steward. And you're going to handle things the way you should. And so in your life and in your finances, you've just got to cross the bridge of faith and you've got to decide that you're going to handle your money the way God says to handle your money. You're not going to do it the world's way. You're going to do it God's way. And what is God's way? It is to honor him with our wealth by tithing and bringing to his house a tithe or 10% of what crosses our hands. What is God's plan? It is not just to tithe, but to be generous and to give above and beyond as led by the Holy Spirit. And I know we, we were on this last Sunday. It was a little quiet, but part of God's financial plan includes saving money. Amen. But see, are you taking action? See, I, I can mention it on Wednesday. I can mention it on Sunday. We can talk about it. We can mention 80, 10, 10, but, but nothing is going to change for the better in your life unless you start taking action. And a lot of times we feel guilty, we feel condemned that we haven't done this, we haven't done that, and we know in our hearts that yes, we, we should have years ago started setting aside 10% or 15% into savings, whatever it is, so we feel bad, we feel guilty, we feel condemned, but praise God, His mercies are new every morning, and He'll forgive you, amen? And you might say, well, Austin, I can't start at 10% or 15%. Well, you can start at 1%. You can start at half a percent. And all this technology, yes, it can be used for evil, but it can be used for good. You, you with the technology or where you work or even with your online banking, you, you can set it up to move, to move money and move it into savings before you ever get your hands on it. Amen? And uh, we're all hardwired differently. Amen? But my father knew what he was doing when I was 15, and he set it up to where that money would be set aside before Austin ever got his hands on it. Because what would I do with it? I'd spend it. I don't know what I would have spent it on, but it'd be gone. Now maybe you're more self-disciplined than that, amen? And if you are, God bless you. But we ought to be saving. Amen. We ought to be saving something every seven days. You ought to be saving for yourself, for your family, for your wife. You ought to be saving for your children. Amen. Are you wisely investing? Or do you go from one get-rich-quick scheme to another? See, we're to save, and then we're to wisely invest. We're to be good stewards. And Jesus said, if, we're, if we can't handle worldly money or finances, then who can trust us with true riches? See, the, the church has had it the exact way. We, we have perceived that if you have no fruit in your life, that somehow that's spiritual. When exactly the opposite is what's true. We can't handle true riches in God's kingdom if we can't handle worldly things well. We can't handle true riches in God's kingdom if we cannot handle worldly things like money and finance as well. So are you saving? Are you investing? And are you investing in things that are wise, not just some get-rich-quick scheme? See, when people get involved in get-rich-quick schemes or some deal with their brother-in-law or whatever it is, they're never working God's plan faithfully and consistently year after year. Well, what do we believe in? The plan of God. We work His plan. We go to work. Amen. We provide for our families. And that's why Jessica and I aren't doing multi-levels during the week. God's plan works, but you got to work the plan. Amen. Aaron will tell you, we were at a minister's conference once. They let someone get up, pitch their multi-level deal. I was gone. I was out of there. You could see the flames from my tracks. <laughs> see, if the word of God is true and if God's plan works, you don't have to get into any of that nonsense. But, but Austin, if I, if I do it the right way, it takes time. Yes! If someone's told you it's going to happen by tomorrow, that's a lie. If someone's told you that if you'll just sell these pills, you'll have 25 free cruises before the end of the year, it's a lie. That's quiet, amen. amen. If you want true riches, if you want spiritual riches, if you want riches in God's kingdom, then you've got to be trustworthy in handling worldly wealth. Number three, 
If you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Last Sunday, we learned that we all have need of things. To live in this world, we all have need of things. We all have need of possessions. We, we use them for various purposes. And we all desire our own property. But what did Jesus say? Verse 12, if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Maybe your dream or desire is to own your own business. Well, in the meantime, what kind of employee are you? Are you a good steward? Do you show up early or do you show up late? Do you wait to leave until your work is finished? Or are you the kind of person that lets other more capable, competent people do your work for you? So you gotta decide what kind of person are you? What kind of steward are you? That's why in college, I hated group projects. Because I knew if you want the A, you gotta do it all yourself so you can make sure it's done right and on time and there are no typos. Jessica said even in engineering, she hated group projects. And of course, as the woman, the, guy, the guys would let her do all the work. You gotta decide what kind of person you are. A man or woman of excellence, a man or woman who shows up early, a man or woman who can be counted on, who does their work with excellence is under the Lord. How do you treat the company's time? How do you treat the company's money? Do you treat the company's money as if it were your own money? And this is a long time ago. This would have been back in probably the late 80s, early 90s. And in those years, my father did a lot of traveling, a lot of traveling for the church, a lot of traveling for missions. And there came a point, probably the early 90s, where God dealt with him about taking care of himself better. And so he knew that he needed to fly first class. But he and my mom made the decision that they would not fly first class on behalf of the church until they first flew first class personally. We, we don't treat God's money or use it in a way that we don't do in our personal lives. And so if you're not willing to pony up and pay for it personally, then really the company shouldn't be doing that on your behalf because you're not yet at that level. See, I'm talking about old fashioned values, honor, personal integrity. Are you truthful and honest on your reimbursements? Years ago, there was a businessman and it came out that he was going on business trips, but I guess they weren't business trips because he was taking a young woman in his office with him on those business trips. Well, that's not a business trip, amen? That's not a business trip to the IRS. That's not a business trip to the Lord. And that will sure enough not be a business trip to your wife either. So you got to decide, are you going to be faithful and a good steward of what you have now? You have to be if you want to rise higher. So if you want to rise higher, live a life of honor and integrity and faithfulness. Be a good steward of the property of others. Be loyal. Be trustworthy. Have discretion. Verse 12, if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? You know, because of my age, it's on my mind all the time. And I think it's on my mind because of the things that we have seen in 2020. You know, we're, we're just weeks away from paying off this building and property, from paying everything off. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. But that's what happens when you're faithful and a good steward. You know, probably every three or six months, there's a story in the news about a ministry going under and going bankrupt because principal payments were never made. See, that, that's not righteous. I said, that's not righteous. A man approached me maybe a year, year and a half ago, complaining about his wife, one of these ladies that if we had saints, she could be nominated as a saint. But, but wanting to sell the house from out from under her feet? No, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. You, you gotta be faithful with what you have now if you want God to bless you with more. You gotta be a good steward of what you have now. So maybe your dream or desire is to have your own home, your own place, your own property. Well, how are you taking care of the property that you're leasing or renting now? 
See, if you're not taking care of what you already have, you're not qualified to go to the next level. And that, that's why when you apply for stuff, they look at your history and your payment history. They're, they're checking it out to see if you are qualified. And our stewardship of money and things at your current level, it shows our Heavenly Father whether you're qualified for Him to entrust you with more. So if you want God to bless you with your own home, your own place, your own property, how are you taking care of the property that you're leasing or renting now? You know, are, they, are there holes in the wall or you get things fixed? Are things taken care of or are things falling apart and falling off? See, stewardship. And I, I know you think, man, Austin, I thought you were going to lay hands on me for a miracle today. I'm saying be a good steward and you'll get your miracle. But see, that takes time. That takes hard work. That takes diligence, amen? Maybe your dream or desire is to own your own car free and clear, but right now you're leasing or financing. Well, how are you taking care of someone else's property? Every Sunday and every Wednesday, we come to the house of God. This is the house of the Lord, but how do we treat God's house? Are we on time or are we late? Are we faithful or do we take things for granted? You know, when I'm, I'm here, whether on a Sunday or during the week, if there's trash in the parking lot, if there's trash in the hallway up, upstairs, you know, I, I pick it up. I throw it away. Pastor does the same. When men are here at prayer, if they're walking around the room praying, if they see a little piece of trash on the floor, periodically I'll see guys pick that up and, and throw that trash away. This is the house of the Lord. So we ought to treat it as the house of the Lord, amen? And we ought to take care of it and we ought to maintain it. And we ought not trash the house of the Lord out. But you gotta treat your own things and your own house and your own place the same way, amen? And instill in your children that God blesses us with things, but we take care of those things, we, we, use those maintain, we use those things, we maintain those things, and if something gets damaged, we get it fixed. And before things are all used up and worn out, when they're still in good condition, we give them away to bless others. Number four, no servant can serve two masters. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one, and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The King James word here for money is mammon, which is the world's system of money. What is the world's system of money? To enslave you in debt and to keep you paying on your debts until the day you die. That is the world's system. And I love the King James, it calls it mammon. Baron Rothschild, once called compound interest, the eighth wonder of the world. The world system is about enslaving us to debt until the day we die. In the late 80s, the Lord told my father that it's a sin to spend more than you take in. And he told my father, he said, that makes your government the biggest sinner of them all. Now that was in the 80s. That's before 2020, amen? See, we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray about what's going on. Because just the way the debt has been increased this year, it has taken it way, 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 way beyond ever fixing it or doing anything about it. And then they want to do it again. See, as long as the Lord tarries, our children, our grandchildren will pay, pay the price. You cannot serve both God and a mammon, which is the world's system of money. You can't, which means it's not possible. So you can't be a child of God and try and have it both ways. You can't be a child of God and try and do it both ways. It's impossible to serve God and mammon, which is the world system. And God wants us to all be free of the world system. God wants us all to be blessed and to have more than enough. What's the goal? Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Paul writes, make it your ambition, so make it your goal to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands, just as we told you, 
so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so you will not be dependent on anybody. Not, not anybody, amen? So you young people, God, God's will for your life is to work and to succeed, amen, to someday so you can be a blessing to mom and dad, but so you're not, you're not older living with mom and dad. Amen. amen. God does not want you to be dependent on anyone or anything. And today we have a nation of people who are dependent on the government. I couldn't believe my eyes yesterday when I read an article linked in Drudge that Americans want more government intervention and more government control. I was absolutely horrified. I thought, these must not be the Americans I know, amen? amen. You know, if anything, we want less intervention, we want less control, we all want to be left alone to live our lives and go to church and to work, amen? amen. So being dependent on the world system being dependent on man or woman or on the job, being dependent on the government is not God's will and it's not God's best. God doesn't want us to be dependent on anyone or anything. And God does not want us to be dependent on mammon, which is the world system. Borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. Borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. God wants you to be free of it, amen? And if you'll work his plan, not overnight, but over time, he'll bring you to that place of freedom. So God, he wants you to be free of the world system. And that's why we preach and teach the way we do at Faith Christian Center, so you will not be dependent on anyone, on anybody. That's the goal. So you will not be dependent on anybody. You've heard pastors say that our job as parents is not done until our children are well-educated, well-married, and self-sufficient. So it's a choice. Are we raising children who will look to the government for life's answers? Are we raising children who will look to the government or man or state as source and supply? Or are we raising producers? Are we raising children that will look to God as their source and as their supply? We should only be dependent upon God. We should not be dependent on man or the world or the world system. God wants us to be free. God wants us to be independent. God doesn't want us to be criers or complainers or beggars. He doesn't want us to live life holding our hand out, amen, hoping some unsaved, wicked politician will give us a break, amen. He wants us to look to him as our source and as our supply. He wants you to be a producer. He wants you to be a winner. He wants you to be an overcomer. But this world, say this world. this world. This world wants you to be a slave until the day you die. It wants us all to live in servitude and bondage and debt until the day we die. But God wants us to be free and to be no man's and no government slave. Number five, you'll either hate the one master or love the other or you'll be devoted to the one master and despise the other. Verse 13, no one can serve two masters. So it's not possible. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So it all comes back to that launching scripture. Matthew 6 and verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given or added to you as well. So who or what do you put first? Who or what do you love? Who or what are you devoted to? Number six, you cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and mammon, which is the world system. It is a choice. It is a decision. That, that's why pastor is so strong on this. You know, when CPAs and bankers were letting everybody know about the PPP monies, even for churches, we, we said, absolutely not. Even back during the years of George W. Bush when they did those faith-based initiative money, we, we didn't take any of that. My, my father had famous pastors, famous preachers tell him, you gotta get you some of that money. No way. 
Our attitude is like Abraham who said to the king of Sodom, I will take nothing from you. Why? You can't have it both ways. You cannot serve both God and mammon, which is the world's system. It is a choice. It is a decision. Verse 13, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money or mammon, the world system. As pastor said during the week of increase, money should serve us. Money should be our servant. So in our lives, we ought to master money. We should not let money master us. So it's a hard issue. Tell your neighbors, say, it's a hard issue. Tell your other neighbors, say, it's a hard issue. It is all about the heart and what we do, how we handle money and how we use money, it reveals what's really going on in the heart. You've heard pastor tell the story about a man, this was a long time ago, and he wasn't a blessing to his wife, he wasn't a, a blessing to his children, but he, he got himself a girlfriend, which is wicked and immoral, and he proceeded to take her to Disney World. Now, he never took his own wife or children to Disney World, but he took this gal to Disney World, and he used his wife's credit card to do it. Then he divorced her and let his wife pay the bill since it was her credit card. Wicked, 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 wicked. But see how we handle money, it reveals what's really going on where? In the heart. It's about the heart. Luke 16, verse 14. The Pharisees, the religious leaders who loved money. They, they didn't just like money. They didn't just use money. They didn't just use money to pay for food or clothes or whatnot with it. They loved money. But see, who are we to love? We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Money is a tool. We're not, we're not to love money. We're, we're to use money for righteous purposes. But they loved money. They heard all of this and they, they were sneering. They were sneering at Jesus. So they had the appearance of religion, but they denied the power thereof. They were hypocrites. They had their answer right in front of them, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, but they rejected him. The Bible tells us that they love praise from men more than praise from God. They were devoted to the things of this world. They loved the things of this world. What did they love? Verse 14, they loved money. And what did Paul tell us? What did he write to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10? He said, for the love of money, not money, the love of money, the love of money is a root, not even the root, but it is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So it's not just a matter of knowing the way. You have to walk in the way. That's what we said Wednesday night. It's not just a matter of hearing the word or hearing a life-changing message. You gotta take action on it. That's why the Bible says, this is the way, walk ye in it. It's a choice. It's a decision to live a Matthew 6.33 lifestyle. It's a choice. It's a decision to put God first. Jesus should be the one we love. But sometimes believers abandon their first love. Jesus tells the church in Ephesus in Revelation, this is in Revelation chapter two, beginning in verse four, you have forsaken your first love. He doesn't say that to unbelievers. He doesn't say that to those that are lost that haven't known God. He says that to a church, one that the apostle Paul himself ministered in. You have forsaken your first love. And who is to be our first love? The Lord. Who's to be the one we love, the one we serve, the one we would do anything for? I have always loved Hebrews 11 and the verses about Moses taken from a basket, raised in Pharaoh's house, in the place of power, in the place of wealth. And Hebrews says that he forsake the glories of Egypt. And he did it for who? He did it for the Lord. See, God should be the one we love. His kingdom should be what we love. 
Jesus is our first love. Repent and do the things you did at first. So what Jesus said in verse 13 is true. Here in Luke 16, 13, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, or mammon, the world system. So who or what will you serve? Who or what will you love? Who or what will you be devoted to? Matthew 6, seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus did not say that we would do without. No. He said that if we'll live life God's way, all these things will be added unto us. It's a heart issue. Tell your neighbor, say, it's about the heart. Tell your other neighbor, say, it's about the heart. So who or what will you love? Who or what will you serve? Who or what will you be devoted to and put first in your life?